alternating order. 30 seconds will be, will be allowed to ask a question, one minute to answer, and 30 seconds will be allowed for an optional rebuttal by the question asker. Uh, once again, Jackie Harper, who has been timing the, those who are debating the earlier motions, will serve as timer for this portion of the program. Uh, after the cross questions by the speakers, the floor will be opened for questions from the City Club members in the audience, which will continue until about 1 p.m. Uh, finally, each speaker will then have a fi five minutes for a closing statement, uh, with Mark Nelson speaking last. <clears throat> uh, our board host seated at the head table is Greg Jackson, member of the Board of Governors and public relations consultant with the Metropolitan Group. He will have the privilege of asking the first of the member questions of our speakers. Uh, the floor will then be open to questions from other City Club members in the audience. Please approach one of the microphones, and you can use uh, either one, <clears throat> even uh, before Greg is finished with this question, so that we can make maximum use of this time. Uh, our speakers today are Dr. Frank Baumeister, president of the Oregon Medical Association, who is a supporter of Measure 44, and Mark Nelson, president of Public Affairs Council, a lobbying and campaign management firm. Uh, Mr. Nelson opposes Measure 44. Dr. Baumeister, you have seven minutes for your opening statement. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to have been invited to address the City Club audience and to discuss an issue of such importance to our state. Ballot Measure 44 will finance continuation and expansion of the Oregon Health Plan. The resulting cigarette price increase will serve to discourage young Oregonians from starting to smoke, and a portion of the revenues will be applied to education programs designed to prevent our youth from smoking and to treatment programs to help smokers quit. The measure will increase the tax on a package of cigarettes from the current 38 cents to 68 cents. Ninety percent of the new tax revenue will go to the Oregon Health Plan, and 10% will go to the Oregon Health Division for new programs in smoking prevention and cessation. Of the current 38 cents tax, 10 cents now designated, designated for the Oregon Health Plan comes from a temporary tax added during the last legislative session and due to expire at the end of 1997. Of the remaining 28 cents, 22 cents goes to the general fund and two cents each go to cities, to counties and to transportation needs for the elderly and the disabled. Measure 44 will increase the tax on a single cigarette from 1.4 to 2.9 cents. And for a package a day smoker, that means only $248.20 per year, not much more than the cost of a single emergency room visit for a smoking related illness. The additional tax will, however, when spread over the approximately 700,000 Oregonians who smoke, provide approximately $168 million in revenues per biennium to support the Oregon Health Plan and to support community-based education programs for smoking prevention and cessation. This is the essence of the cigarette tax. There is no mystery. I want to speak for a moment about Oregon's groundbreaking health reform bill of 1989, authored by our governor, Dr. John Kitzhaber, then president of the Oregon Senate. That health reform package, now known as the Oregon Health Plan, was devised with the goal of providing universal access to basic health care for all Oregonians. The package consisted of 20, Senate Bill 27, which extended Medicaid to everyone under the federal poverty level. Senate Bill 935, the so-called employer mandate, and Senate Bill 534, which established a risk pool for all those Oregonians declared uninsurable by all conventional payers because of pre-existing chronic illness. The employer mandate encountered obstacles, and as you know, was not implemented, but the remainder of the plan has been successful, having enrolled approximately 350 Oregonians who would not otherwise have health care coverage. Currently, all those with incomes beneath the federal poverty level are eligible, plus children under age six and pregnant women up to 133% of the federal poverty level. The next goal for the near future is to expand coverage to all children under 18 and to cover all pregnant women under 200% of the federal poverty level. Under the Oregon Health Plan, an additional 130,000 previously uninsured Oregonians have obtained public insurance coverage. This plan has received international recognition and acclaim as the most equitable attempt ever 
to provide basic universal health care coverage to an indigent or low-income population. Further expansion of the coverage to more low-income Oregonians will require additional funding, and the tobacco tax initiative is the result of this need. Health care costs in Oregon attributable tobacco to tobacco use amount to an astronomical figure. Tobacco costs to the state Medicaid program in 1993 were estimated at $63.87 million. In the four years prior to 1993, there had been a 15% annual increase in those costs. And if that 15% increase is projected to the four years since 1993, we can predict that Medicaid tobacco-related costs for the 1997-98 biennium will be around $250 million. If we use ultra-conservative estimates of only a 5% annual increase, then the predicted tobacco-related costs for the same period would be $160 million, approximately equal to the revenues generated by the new tax. Smoking has an enormous impact on public health in the United States and is our leading preventable cause of death. An incredible annual toll of over 420,000 smoking-related deaths exceeds the number of deaths due to alcohol abuse, drug abuse, traffic accidents, homicides, suicides, and AIDS combined. The cost of treatment of tobacco-related disease is mind-boggling, with national figures estimated to be over $60 billion per year. Although cigarette use is decreasing overall in the United States, there's been a steady and recently a more rapid increase in smoking among teenagers. A recent Communicable Disease Center report noted that 35% of all youths in grades 9 to 12 smoke cigarettes, up from 28% in 1991. The percentage of underage African-American males who smoke has doubled from 14% to 28% in the past five years. A recent University of Michigan study found that smoking among eighth graders has increased 30% between 1991 and 1994, and smoking among 10th graders increased 22%. Our nation's youth, especially those most socioeconomically disadvantaged, are being exploited and seduced into an addiction by aggressive marketing tactics of an unscrupulous industry. Nicotine is an extremely addictive substance, a fact recognized long ago by the tobacco researchers and capitalized upon to hook smokers for life, albeit a shortened one. It has been proven that nicotine addiction must occur at a young age or it does not usually occur. Research has found that 50% of all adult smokers are addicted by the age of 13 and 90% of all adult smokers are addicted by the age of 19. The average teenage smoker starts at 14. 60% of all new smokers are under age 16, and 90% of all new smokers are under age 21. Please recall, if you will, that it is absolutely illegal to sell cigarettes to anyone under the age of 18. How does this happen? Minors are targeted by tobacco advertising, billboards are prevalent near schools, cigarette displays are featured prominently, promotional gimmicks are aimed at the youth market, cigarettes are sold singly or in kitty packs to cater to youth who are short of cash, vending machines are strategically placed, sly advertisements appeal to the psychological and social needs of adolescents, low self-esteem, issues of rebellion and defiance of authority, risk-taking behavior and anxiety in social situations. It is no accident that in a survey of grade school children in California, Joe Camel was more familiar than Mickey Mouse. An aggressive counterattack by a concerned society is necessary to reverse this dangerous trend. In 1992, a panel of health economists and public health experts convened by the National Cancer Institute's Division of Cancer Prevention reviewed the domestic and international scientific literature on cigarette excise taxes and smoking. Their report, released in August 1993, concluded that increasing such taxes would considerably reduce teen smoking and would also decrease tobacco consumption in adults, particularly in lower economic groups. In California, in 1988, the tobacco tax was raised to 25%, and over the next four years, they raised it 25 cents, and over the next four years, tobacco consumption decreased by 24%. I can only hope we will experience similar success in Oregon. Mr. Nelson, you have uh, seven minutes for your opening statement. Thank you very much. As has been indicated, uh, I represent uh, the committee in opposition to uh, the tobacco tax, ballot measure 44. As you can tell, we, uh, as some, I think the Oregonian termed it, uh, we have some uh, 
very major kinds of players involved in this issue, the Oregon Medical Association, and of course the tobacco industry and retailers in Oregon. I think they cited it as the Battle of the Titans. I'm here to tell you that I am something shorter than a titan. Um, but ballot measure 44 really is about, about money and about public policy. How are we going to uh, fund the Oregon Health Plan and at what level? And that basic function of, of, of this process here and I think of the ballot measure process. As has been indicated, the proposal before you is to increase uh, cigarette taxes by 78% or $160 million partially to fund the Oregon Health Plan. You should know that we are already paying uh, smokers in Oregon, Oregon are going to smoke $54 million toward the Oregon Health Plan. So I sort of set that back as a backdrop. Uh, the option uh, or the, the opposition has uh, paints the specter, uh, as you've seen on some of the, the advertising on some other ballot measures in this state, is that big tobacco has come into the state of Oregon uh, to uh, defeat this measure. And I want to tell you that is correct. Uh, the tobacco industry is funding the opposition campaign uh, to this measure. But this isn't about big tobacco. Tobacco companies don't pay taxes in Oregon. Oregonians pay tobacco taxes in Oregon. This is about a measure that will tax uh, five to 600,000 Oregonians who smoke and who use tobacco products. And I think that's a very important element. There's a key fundamental issue uh, from our perspective in terms of this campaign. It is not fair to ask a minority of Oregonians to pay for a program that is everyone's responsibility. Now, as has been indicated uh, by the doctor, is that people who smoke increase health insurance cost. In a recent, uh, uh, not recent, excuse me, in the last 13 years, the Center for Disease Control, which is not known for its affiliation with the tobacco industry, I should point out, has put out uh, data related to state by state uh, Medicaid cost. And in that data, they indicate what is the the share for smoking related illnesses for the state's expenditures for Medicaid. In Oregon, and this number has been uh, cons fairly consistent over the last 15 years, from fiscal year 1993 data, Medicaid cost for smoking related diseases in Oregon, cost for, the, for these diseases in Oregon are 6.7% or $41.1 million. Oregonians who smoke already pay $54 million into the Oregon Health Plan. And again, 6.7%, $41 million. Oregonians who smoke pay 8.9% or $54 million. With this 78% increase in the cigarette and tobacco taxes, Oregonians who smoke will be paying almost 30% of the state cost of the health care program, over $170 million. Again, we come back to the fundamental issue. The Oregon Health Plan is a statewide program for all Oregonians who are eligible. Is it fair to ask a minority of Oregonians who today, in this case, happens to be smokers, to pay for a program that is everyone's responsibility? It's a fundamental question. I'll have to, have to be honest with you. When we ask that question initially, people's response is, I don't smoke, let them pay. Quite honestly, that is a response. And, but as as we found in this campaign, as Oregonians think about the fundamental fairness of asking a minority to pay not 6.7% of the share of their cost that's attributed to them, but 30%, almost 30%, $170 million, I think we find the answer is no. The Oregon Health Plan, as, uh, as has been uh, explained today, was actually started in 1989, but was not uh, implemented until uh, at the end of or beginning of fiscal year 1994. What is it? How does it work? In that legislation that was passed in 89 and then that, that did not go into effect for many years, several changes were made. Mostly changes that very, very few people, including some of the legislators that voted on those changes, did not realize their impact. One of those changes was to change the wording about reimbursement of medical providers. To change that wording from standard and customary to actual cost reimbursement. Oregon is the only state in the country that has actual cost reimbursement. One in 49. That formula that came into being in 1989 and was implemented when they started Oregon Health Plan 
has caused huge increases in, in medical provider payments at a cost of hundreds of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars that could have been used to insure additional Oregonians. Now, when they had the choice, when they had the choice to insure more people or to increase cost, or medical provider cost, they choose to increase the medical provider cost. And today, three years after the beginning of the program, smokers, Oregonians who smoke, are being asked to increase taxes to pay for the Oregon Health Plan. In addition, in that same legislative year, they added another little amendment. They said that those medical fees, when contracted, could never be reduced unless, uh, even if the state ran out of money. So from our vantage point is, is the issue of the Oregon Health Plan and what it has cost to date that Oregonians who smoke are being asked to spend $160 million a biennium to fund the Oregon Health Plan and the, uh, uh, the other programs involved. What has happened in the last three years in terms of the Oregon Health Plan? We've had uh, a 46 percent increase in eligibles. That's good. We've had a 106 percent increase in cost, and that's to pay those huge fees. Again, we make a choice between the fees increasing or providing more people. This particular tax, if we reduced the fee increase to what every other state's formulas are, you could fund 100,000 people in the Oregon Health Plan. But those are the choices that we make. In conclusion, again, it's unfair to ask a minority to pay for the cost of a program that's everyone's responsibility. And it's unfair to have a program that does not meet the financial responsibilities that we believe a program of a statewide nature should meet. Thank you very much. We now come to the portion of the program allowing cross questions. Uh, Dr. Baumeister, do you have the opportunity? Yes, why don't you move back to this microphone. Uh, the opportunity to ask a question of Mr. Nelson, uh, if no longer than 30 seconds in length. My first question is uh, to ask Mr. Nelson, what, what suggestions do you have as reasonable interventions to arrest the epidemic of teenage smoking? Well, the issue of teenage smoking is, is, is very complicated. And I think, as the doctor has indicated, he believes that it's a result of advertising, targeted advertising by the tobacco industry. Uh, without getting into a lot of detail on this, the tobacco industry has spent millions of dollars nationwide to try to deter uh, uh, teenage smoking. Teenage smoking is something that the, the tobacco industry opposes. I don't believe the $7 million a year that is in this program is going to solve that particular problem because it's much more pervasive than that. Uh, we have seen in, in, in neighboring states where you have major uh, smuggling activity as a result of high cigarette taxes that one of the biggest problems you have there is no one checks the age of a youngster that comes in when we're talking about smuggling uh, cigarettes. In Canada, in Michigan, they've had massive kinds of problems with exactly what the doctor's referring to, and that is uh, youth smoking. Dr. Baumeister, you have 30 seconds to rebut if you wish. Well, the issue of, of uh, the millions of dollars spent to deter uh, teenagers from smoking is nonsense. Uh, if you read the Brown Williamson papers and uh, read a book by Mr. Wiltz, who's a, a writer for the New York Times and a fellow from the Public Health Department at Harvard, uh, there was a concentrated effort from about the 60s on to seduce the youth into smoking. Uh, it was a concentrated uh, industry effort. So the, f the fact speaks for itself. Mr. Nelson, you have 30 seconds to ask a question. Uh, yes, doctor. As I discussed in, in, in my data, the um, Oregonians who use tobacco products already pay through existing taxes, their fair share of health care costs as it relates to the Medicaid program. How can you justify singling out the 20 percent of Oregonians uh, who smoke to pay for a program, again, that is everyone's responsibility? Well, again, I have the, uh, the, the figures that I have here from the Oregon Health Division and the, and the National Center for Disease Control that the direct cost from tobacco use uh, in uh, 1993 were $266 million. And as I outlined in my uh, uh, 
uh, opening statement, the, uh, if we use very conservative estimates of a 5% increase per annum, uh, the uh, revenues generated by the new cigarette tax will barely match the expenditures for tobacco-related illness. Mr. Nelson, you may be back. Yes, and doctor uses a global number as it relates to, uh, or, uh, to Oregon. This particular another number, the 16.7% relates to Medicaid costs, which is what the Oregon health plan is all about. Smokers pay $41 million right now, or, or their share of the cost is $41 million, and they pay $54 million. They are paying by $13 million by the CDC, Center for Disease Control's own numbers, $13 million over their cost. The basic issue is should, should they be asked to spend another $158 million, $60 million uh, additional for that purpose. Dr. Baumeister, your second question. My second question is uh, essentially, is there an acceptable excise tax or user fee that would be appropriate for tobacco products in Oregon? No. Uh, the, the, uh, the proposed tax would make it one of, the, one of the third highest in the country. The 10 cent tax that has been added to the 28 cents, as the doctors indicated, is set to sunset. If you've ever seen a sunsetted tax in Oregon in the legislature, you know, bring it to me. But uh, it has already been continued once, and it will be continued again. Uh, we believe that the current level of 38 cents is a proper level of taxation. Uh, again, Oregonians are paying their fair share, uh, Oregonians who smoke are paying their fair share of the Oregon Health Plan and are certainly adding another hundreds of millions of dollars to the state general fund for other general governmental purposes. Dr. Baumeister, do you wish to rebut? No, I have no problem. Uh, Mr. Nelson, your second question. Doctor, did and I spoke on in terms of the issues of the fee increases, and I know this has been subject of, uh, of much debate. Um, does and or did and does the Oregon Medical Association still support those uh, huge reimbursement increases that the legislature gave to providers uh, instead of adding Oregonians to the health plan? Would you be in favor of a partial reduction of those fees uh, in order to ensure more Oregonians? No. Currently, uh, the fee schedule is paid is 62 percent of bill charges. Prior to institution of the Oregon Health Plan, uh, access was not universal. Uh, Oregon is the only state that has universal access to health care, as it does through the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, previously, uh, when the money ran out, people didn't get paid, and so access was limited. And when the Oregon Health Plan came into existence, uh, it was realized that unless you had provider participation, you had no access. And all these millions of people, these thousands of people uh, that would have been brought into the plan, it's alleged if uh, by the millions of dollars of savings by reducing the fees uh, would have reduced access. You have to have cooperation of the provider community. Mr. Nelson, do you have a rebuttal? Well, my rebuttal is there are 49 other states who do not reimburse on the actual cost reimbursement schedule, which is in each one of those states would, re would increase the, the, re the reimbursement fees, the 30 to 40 percent that, that I've been talking about. So 49 other states get by on a reimbursement schedule uh, and, and provide those services. What I'm trying to, to point out is that we have made a conscious choice here. And now we're coming back to increase those fees at, at the expense of insuring more people. Now we're coming back to Oregonians who smoke and saying, we want you to increase your taxes over and above uh, what your fair share is in order to pay for someone else's program. And we believe that's not right. We now come to the portion of the program allowing City Club members in the audience to ask questions of the speakers. Please limit your questions to 30 seconds and please frame them in the interrogative. The, uh, the first question will be asked by board host Greg Jackson. Thank you. Um, I'd like to play the devil's advocate to both of you and raise an issue that hasn't been uh, brought up yet, and that is the uh, issue of secondhand smoke. Uh, as has been stated today, the majority of Oregonians do not smoke, uh, yet, yet remain subjected to secondhand smoke. And healthcare providers have proven that secondhand smoke is indeed a very serious medical problem. Given that reality of secondhand smoke and the, um, how, how common it is in our society, why shouldn't the smoking minority financially support their actions that may potentially lead to the health problems of others? 
Would you like me to applaud? I think I'm in the barrel. Uh, if there's no, no further response to the question, are there questions from the audience? Please, uh, please come. Oh, oh. I thought uh, the doctor was oh. going to respond first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, in 1988, uh, Oregonians rejected by about 60 to 40 percent margin a, uh, a major modification of Oregon's uh, pioneer indoor clean air act that was passed in the early uh, 80s. The, uh, and by a huge margin because in the end result what that proposed which was to ban smoking basically any place that had a roof over it, Oregonians felt went too far. Oregonians system of designated smoking areas is a system of balance. I am not here to tell you that it works perfectly. Uh, smoke does drift and we, ha we have uh, segments of, of restaurants and, and, and other buildings that are segregated. But it is a system that tries to recognize the balance of both. Very important function of the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act is it allows employers to make their own decisions, allows restaurants to make their own decisions. Uh, our industry does not oppose a restaurant or an employer who decides to ban smoking in their, in their workplace because that is their decision, their decision made with their employees. That is happening throughout this state as people come to that conclusion. So we believe that's the proper way that you handle uh, the issue of indoor clean air. I'm Charlie Hinkle, member of the club, and this question is for you, uh, Mark, uh, Mr. Nelson. I, I think you make some good points about uh, proper tax policy and funding of the Oregon Health Plan, the legitimate uh, issues, and I, uh, I thought your opening statement was uh, uh, laid some of those issues out very well. I am disturbed by the way the political campaign has gone in the, over the media airwaves, though. The advertisements, the radio advertisements that I have heard in, uh, in opposition to Measure 44 seem to me to be the most blatantly false and misleading advertisements I have ever heard, confusing the new tax with the existing tax. And I wonder why you don't make your good points instead of these, these false and misleading uh, uh, radio ads. Well, we are uh, we are making many uh, many different points on the on the airways. Well, let me speak to the issue of, of, of what Mr. Hinkle has raised. We didn't write this ballot measure. Okay, obviously, this ballot measure was written in such a way in which, rather than just taking, which they did with the ten cent tax, and creating a statute and says and saying we we got a three cent tax, it's going to fund the Oregon Health Plan and smoking cessation programs. Could have done that. They didn't do that. They took the old tax and they took the new tax. They mixed them together. They came up with brand new formulas. The Legislative Revenue Research Office calls it a redistribution plan. They redistrib redistributed redistrib that money. Again, we didn't write that tax. When we went out with a ballot title and showed the ballot title to Oregonians, you know what we got back? We asked a question. How much of this tax dollars do you think are going to the, to the Oregon Health Plan? They said most, if not all. That's why you see that ad that says not all of these taxes go to the Oregon Health Plan because the way the proponents wrote that measure, it gives the impression that all the money is going to the health plan. And when people think it's all going to the health plan, they say, oh, okay. And, and when they find out that it's not, that's when they start to question what is happening. So those, they, they mix the new tax and the old taxes, not us. Yes, Scott Wise, City Club me member. My question is from uh, Mr. Nelson. It seems to me that proposed tax is in effect a voluntary tax. If you don't want to pay it, don't smoke. <laughs> I think most Oregonians would be delighted if nobody pays the tax. Now, the tobacco industry, you and the tobacco industry, take the view that, that this imposes an unfair burden on the group of smokers. Is it not implicit in that argument that the smokers don't have a voluntary choice, in fact, because they're addicted? Well, I mean, we're talking about addiction, we're talking about taxes. I'm here to tell you that, that people who smoke have to pay this tax, and you're asking them to pay a 78% increase, $160 million more, to fund a program that is not their total responsibility. And again, it's just a fun, I ask you, is that fair? Yeah. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah. Then next time, the problem is the next time we turn to our neighbor who has another something else that they do and we say we're going to tax that now for, for you to pay for a program that's everyone's responsibility. That's the issue. And again, I say that over and over, uh, but that's really what it comes down to. 
Uh, Dr. Baumeister, I'm afraid this is also for uh, Mark Nelson. Mm, surprise. Um, you, <laughs> I, I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Nelson, if this uh, talk about cost reimbursement isn't uh, its own uh, smoke screen. Because of managed care, most Oregonians are not uh, are in programs in which uh, uh, cost reimbursement doesn't really directly apply. And the main ones that aren't in managed care arrangements are the frail elderly and the people that, for some reason or other, couldn't be uh, put into managed care arrangements. And those people are a lot of them are in nursing homes. So I'm just wondering, isn't the effect of what you're talking about reducing reimbursement? Uh, in effect uh, going to have the greatest impact on the v most frail and sick portion of our society? No, uh, not at all. The, um, uh, the Oregon Health Plan funds uh, fully capitated uh, plans, and those fees have gone up the 30 to 42 percent that, that, that I referred to. That is a fundamental increase in the cost of the program. Now, you can say, okay, I'm willing to pay those fees. Now, I think a very, very important point is, when did you hear this public policy discussed in the legislature? When was it up on the wall in the Budget Writing Committee that we are going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on increased fees? In the same years we were raising tuition through the roof and in our colleges and our universities, when we were having major problems in terms of corrections, when Portland School District is struggling to find funds, I can tell you that public policy debate never occurred where the legislature was told this is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, here's your choice. Do you want to give this fee increase unlike any other state in the country? Or do you want to fund something else, like tuition, uh, not increasing tuition, or, not, uh, or, or giving more money through K through 12? Those decisions have never been discussed in the legislature, I can guarantee you. Next question. Rod Monroe, a member and author of the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act. Uh, you indicated that you thought the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act was fair, that your industry supported it, and also that your industry supported the 38 cent level as an appropriate level for tobacco taxes. My question is, in 1981, did the tobacco industry support the Oregon Indoor Clean Air Act when it was going through the legislature? And how many of those 38 cents, when they were enacted by the legislature, did the tobacco industry support? Okay. The, uh, my understanding, I didn't lobby for the tobacco industry in 1981 is the industry did oppose the Indoor Clean Air Act in 1981. In 1988, they supported the system after seeing it in effect for the number of years. It was the first state in the country that they supported a system of designated smoking areas. So it was the system that was put together that after time was felt to have the balance. The, cigarette, the tobacco industry did oppose the 10 cent increase. Uh, when we agreed to it finally in the, not the last session, but the, the previous session, it was agreed to because they said it was going to sunset. Uh, that didn't occur and it continued on as I believe it will continue on again. Next question. Andrew Kayser, City Club member. My question is for you, Dr. Baumeister. Welcome back. Um, conceivably, we could argue to tax fresh food and vegetables to pay for adequate housing for migrant laborers. Is it reasonable and good public policy to tax one constituency to provide a benefit for another? I look on a cigarette tax as a user fee. Uh, as I said uh, before, you're dealing with a toxic substance, a poison. Uh, it's been said it's the, uh, it's the only uh, agent that uh, kills when used is directed. Uh, the, uh, the cost, uh, the cost for, of smoking to the, to the nation and, and to the state have been underestimated here. Uh, the cost to the state of Oregon, estimated by the CDC, for one biennium is $1.7 billion, 895 or thereabouts million dollars per annum total cost. Everybody uh, that smokes is not in the Oregon Health Plan. Uh, the Oregon Health Plan expanded coverage to 120,000 Oregonians that would have not had coverage in the previous Medicaid years. In the 10 years prior to institution of the Oregon Health Plan, um, Medicaid fees ro rose 20 percent. Uh, the cost of running a medical office increased 100 percent. Uh, nobody's getting rich off the Oregon Health Plan. The, uh, they pay today at about 62 percent of bill charges. And uh, the, uh, to get back to your question, the devastation of smoking in the state is, is, is incredible. Next question. I'm Peter Heuser, a City Club <clears throat> member. Dr. Baumeister, you, you've made some good points, but you haven't responded, I think, to Mr. Nelson's point that he looks at the Oregon statistics, whereas you're looking at the national statistics. 
I know you commented on that briefly a moment ago, but could you respond to that argument? And perhaps Mr. Nelson could comment on your response. I, uh, I'm a physician, I'm not an accountant. Uh, I think we're talking about money here. I, it, I agree, as, we, as he said to start with, we're talking about money. I think it was Oscar Wilde who described a cynic as someone who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. And I think that what we're looking at here is, uh, is an issue of, of public health. The direct costs from tobacco use in the state of Oregon uh, are $266 million, the direct costs in the state of Oregon. The indirect costs are about $695 million. That comes to a fair piece of change. That is not a national figure, that's, that's an Oregon figure. Oregon Health Division uh, and National Center for Disease Control. I think it's very important to hear the words, direct cost in the state of Oregon, not direct cost to the Medicaid program. This tax funds the Medicaid program. Here is the last 13 years of CDC numbers, and they have not varied to any significant degree. 6.7%, 50, $41 million this year. That is what is uh, attributable to smoking-related diseases in Oregon's Medicaid program. We're already paying $54 million. It's a fundamental issue of fairness. Next question. Connie Powell, member. A question for you, Mr. Nelson. Um, Dr. Baumeister told us that cigarette consumption decreased by 24% in California after they instituted uh, a tax and a decreased tax. You yourself told us that you did not support, in fact, were against cigarette use by the youth. What do you consider the desirability of cigarette use by our adult population? Well, I think adults can make that choice as to whether they want to use cigarette products. I do not believe, and I don't think, and the industry does not believe that children uh, are able to make that kind of choice. The, I'm not familiar with the California numbers, other than that particular tax, I believe, went in effect in 1988. It was a huge increase. I think it was 50 cents. And there was a dramatic decrease in purchases by, uh, by people in California. But that didn't mean people necessarily stopped smoking they went someplace else to make their purchases. And the issue of, again, smuggling, uh, you all have heard about Canada dramatically reducing its taxes, uh, and they did so primarily because they were developing such a huge illicit drug uh, or tobacco testing or tobacco trafficking uh, um, program up there. And so uh, the issue of smuggling, I think, was a big issue in California and was a big issue in those other states that have had very large increases. We're running out of time for member questions. I think we'll limit it to just the two people who are standing at the microphone now. And please be brief in your questions, and gentlemen, if you could be brief in your responses. Alice Simpson, member of City Club and teacher of eighth graders and seventh graders, and I brought several of them with me today. Uh, Dr. Baumeister, I asked them to take notes. You covered material that was excellent, and they couldn't write fast enough. It's my feeling, and if you educate the young people, they have half a chance, and if you could give us a copy of the material that you gave, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. I'm Nancy Lipset from the City Club, and Mr. Nelson, you are inferring that tobacco users are paying more than their fair share for the Oregon Health Plan. However, aren't the private in insurance companies and the HMOs paying for the tobacco-related illnesses? I didn't know we were going to increase cigarette taxes to pay for all the private health care, too. Um, again, uh, my dad and our things here is directed to what's at hand. This ballot measure increases property, ta or property tax, uh, cigarette taxes, tobacco taxes by uh, $160 million uh, for the Oregon Health Plan, uh, for a plan that we feel has had some major, major problems. Again, 106% increase of cost, and we've only expanded eligibility by 46%. That has to beg the question as to what we're, what we're doing with these dollars. We've got over $7.2 million that in, in 94 and 95 that we had to go back on overpayments that were made to hospitals and providers and take back. We're still trying to get some of that money back. The government uh, is subsidizing the tobacco growers, however. Well, I'm not in South Carolina. <laughs> uh, 
That concludes the member questions. Um, Dr. Baumeister, you now have five minutes for a closing statement. Thank you. <clears throat> the opponents of Measure 44 call themselves the Fairness Matters to Oregonians Committee. I would hesitate to associate the term fairness with an industry so practiced at the art of deception and which knowingly produces the only product in existence which kills when taken exactly as directed. For many years, the tobacco industry knew that smoking caused lung cancer. They knew that condensates of tobacco smoke produced cancers when applied to the skin of mice. They knew that nicotine was a powerfully addicting substance. They, in fact, added nicotine to tobacco in the cigarette manufacturing process to ensure levels that were sufficient to addict. They secretly employed genetic engineering to develop a tobacco strain which contained an especially high and incidentally illegal nicotine level. They recognized their need to addict children early, and they specifically targeted that age group for aggressive marketing. All the while, they denied that smoking was harmful or that nicotine was addicting. Tragically, manufacturers are now flooding third world countries with their products, using the techniques there that were so successful in the United States in the early part of the century. In Africa, for instance, per capita smoking has increased 32% in the last decade. It is ironic that as a form of third world killers, malnutrition and preventable or treatable infections are controlled, widespread use of a recognized fatal toxin is being promoted. Fairness matters to Oregonians is no more than a front for the tobacco industry. We supporters of Measure 44 are up against a huge industry which contributes over $60 billion annually to the national economy from direct and indirect expenditures associated with cigarette sales. This represents 2.5% of the gross national product. There are 2 million tobacco-related jobs in this country. 2 billion pounds of tobacco are grown per year in the United States, representing 20% of the world crop. Tobacco sales provide substantial tax revenues, approximately $3.5 billion per year in federal taxes and $4 billion in state taxes. Tobacco is a protected, lucrative crop. Since the 1930s, federal price support and production controls have guaranteed a minimal price to growers and provided subsidies as incentives for, incentives for others not to grow tobacco. As a consequence, an acre of tobacco today generates around $4,000 an acre, whereas an acre of corn is worth about $100. Tobacco is big business at its worst. It is estimated that $26 million were spent in an attempt to defeat the tobacco referendum in California in 1988. The recent unsuccessful campaign to defeat a tax proposal in Massachusetts cost many millions of dollars. Six million dollars is the estimate here in Oregon. Little wonder that some scientists, many legislators, and an army of attorneys and lobbyists over the years have willingly enlisted in the ranks of defenders of an industry about which I can say nothing good. Thomas Jefferson wrote that money, not morality, is the principle of commercial nations. And I, might stand, and I wonder how he might stand on this issue today, were he a representative to Congress from Virginia. I would hope that he would not sell out once he learned the facts and realized the jeopardy to our nation's health. My highly respected and capable adversary today here has chosen employment by the tobacco company opposing ballot measure 44. And his rationalization of his acceptance of their generous compensation brings to mind poor misguided Roderigo and Othello. If you recall the evil plotting Iago, the devil incarnate, scheming to displace the faithful Cassio, Othello's lieutenant, enlist the gullible Roderigo, a former suitor of Desdemona, now wife of Othello, to murder Cassio. Roderigo, lying in wait for Cassio, rationalizes the act. I have no great devotion to the deed, and yet he hath given me satisfying reasons. Tis but a man gone. Well, tis in fact a goodly number of men and women who have gone. The body count now here in North America is approaching a half million gone prematurely, including the Marlboro Man, innumerable celebrities, and more personally, my own mother, who joined that innumerable caravan after inhaling two packages of pell mells for 40 years. I contend that no one should die from preventable disease. Children should not smoke. Society should make every effort to prevent their introduction to tobacco. Nicotine addiction must be treated as the disease it is. The public must be educated regarding the tobacco industry and the danger of tobacco products. The Oregon Health Plan must be continued and expanded, but needs and deserves support. A use of fee on these noxious products which contribute so significantly to the cost of health care is perfectly appropriate. I therefore urge you to support ballot measure 44. Thank you. Mr. Nelson, you have five minutes to close. 
Thank you. I think I understand that Dr. Baumeister uh, doesn't like the tobacco industry. But we're not talking about the tobacco industry. We're talking about ballot measure 44, we're talking about Oregonians who smoke, and we're talking about taxation. Ballot measure 44 pre prevents, uh, pre presents several policy issues. The first one, obviously, is who should pay. There are two answers. Everybody, who should pay for the Oregon plan, Oregon health plan? Everybody, or someone else besides me? Those are the two answers to that, that policy issue. We can't hide behind generalizations that smokers increase the, the health care cost with no numbers. It's very easy to stand up and say, smokers should pay because smokers increase health care cost without ever giving any data. I gave you the data today. Smokers in Oregon are paying more than their fair share of the Oregon health plan today without this uh, 78% increase, increase in taxes, which will take their share, not from the 6.7% uh, that the Center for Disease Control says it is, and they're already paying 8.9, it'll take their share to almost 30%. Again, I ask you the question, is it fair to single out one group of people to ask them to pay for a program that's everybody's responsibility? Another policy issue. How much do we want to pay for the Oregon Health Plan? How is it managed? And is it more important than other state programs? Those are very important policy issues. I represent other people in, in Salem, higher education faculty, Head Start, people that are deserving of important programs, not just tobacco. Never do, have we had the debate about spending hundreds of millions of dollars instead of cutting tuition, instead of faculty salary increases, instead of more money in K through 12. That has never been a debate before the legislature because they didn't know. They didn't know changing three words and going to a cost-based reimbursement that no other state in this country has. Changing those three words, we're going to add hundreds of millions of dollars to the cost of this program. That was never on the board and never discussed as a policy issue. No public debate, debate. The issue came up here today, and one of the questions is, why are we talking about uh, uh, reconstitution of the tax? We're talking about diversion of this money because they mixed the old tax with a new tax. They're the ones that came up with a new formula. They're the ones that are confusing the voters into thinking that this measure puts all tobacco taxes into the health plan, and as you've heard today from both speakers, it does not. And that's a very important message that we want to deliver. Finally, in conclusion, this tax is on one segment of Oregon. Forget for a moment that it's smokers, and think who else it could be. A specialized tax singling out somebody to pay for more than their fair share. If you can, with your, take your blinders off and put smokers aside and say, if it was somebody else, would it be fair to ask someone to pay not 6.7%, but 30% of a cost of a program that benefits everybody? I say that's not fair and it's not right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank Baumeister and Mark Nelson for a lively and informative interchange on this uh, current topic. We are adjourned.